Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons, Chapter 5. But her resolve to sleep late into the next morning was partly frustrated by a shocking row which broke out below her window in what she, muttering sleepily and furiously from her bed, described as the middle of the night. Male voices were raised in anger, coming up out of the blanket of dead, sullen darkness, pierced by the far-off shrilling of cockerels. Flora fancied she knew one of the voices. Shame on him, was Reuben, to bite the hand that fed thee as a cowdling. Who should know the wants of the dumb beast better than better nor me? Tis not, for not, I nursed our pointless, when she was three days old and blind as a wren. I know what's in her heart better than I know what's in the heart of some humans. Be that as it may, shouted another voice, strange to Flora. Graceless has lost a leg. Where is it? Answer me that, you daughter and old fool of a man. Who will buy Graceless now, when I take her down to be a Sean Market? Who wants a cow with only three legs, saving some great old circus man looking round for freakies to put in his show? There was a piercing cry of dismay. Never mind our Graceless in one of those the circuses. The shame of it would kill me, Moss Reuben. Aye, and I would too. If I could get hold of anyone to buy her, circus or no circus, but no one will. Aye, tis all the same, cold comfort stock ne'er finds a buyer, with the queen's bane blighting our corn, and the king's evil laying waste to clover, and the prince's forfeit bringing black ruin to the hay, and the sows as barren as come ask it. Aye, tis the same tale everywhere, all over the farm. Where's that leg? Answer me that. I don't know, Miss Reuben, and if I did, I wouldn't tell you. I know what goes on in the hearts of the dumb beasts, where I was spying on them to see where they leave their legs from morn till eve. A beast needs solitude, same as man does. I'd take shame to myself, Miss Reuben, to watch over them beasts like you do, a waiting for dead man's shoes, and a counting every blade a spore in and a mouthful of dumb, the dumb beasts eat. Aye, said another voice, meaningfully, and counting the very feathers of the chickens, let fall to see no one makes off with him. Well, why should I not? shouted the voice called Mus Reuben. Do I pay ye wages, Mark Dollar, or steal to chickens fe or steal the chickens' feathers and carry them off into Beershorn and sell them for good money? I don't sell the feathers. May I never set hand to plough again if I do. Tis my Nancy I takes them whom with my Nancy. Oh do ye? Well, you do, do ye? And for why? You know well why, returned the third voice sullenly. Aye, told me a pack of tales about trimming dolls' hats with good chicken feathers. As though there were no other use for them feathers them chickens drop than to trim the hat of a lot of idle, worthless dolls. Now hark ye, mock dollar. Here, Flora found it useless to try to pretend herself back to into sleep any longer, so she got crossly out of bed and felt her way across the room, to the glimmering gray square which marked the window. She pushed it open a little wider and called down into the darkness. I say, do you think you would mind not talking quite so loudly, please? I am so sleepy, and I should be so grateful if you would. Silence, emphatic as a thunderclap, followed her request. She felt, half asleep as she was, that it was a flabbergasted silence. She hoped drowsily that it would last long enough for her to drift off into sleep again. And it did. When she again woke, it was daylight. She rolled over in bed and dutifully did her morning stretch and looked at her watch. It was half past eight. Not a sound came up from the yard outside nor from the depths of the old house. Everybody might have died in the night. Not a hope of hot water, of course, thought Flora, wandering round the room in her dressing gown. However, she rubbed a little of the water in the ewer, yes, there was a ewer, between her palms and was pleased to find that it was soft water, so she did not mind washing in cold. The regiment of small porcelain jars and pots on her dressing table would help her to protect her fair skin from any rigors of climate, but it was pleasant to know that the water was her ally. She dressed in pleasant leisure, studying her room. She decided she liked it. It was square and unusually high, and papered with a bold, though faded, design of darker red upon crimson. The fireplace was elegant, the grate was basket-shaped, and the mantelpiece was of marble, floridly carved, 
and yellowed by age and exposure. Upon the mantelpiece itself rested two large shells, whose gentle curves shaded from white to the richest salmon pink. These were reflected in the large old silvery mirror which hung directly above it. The other mirror was a long one. It stood in the darkest corner of the room and was hidden by a cupboard door when the latter was opened. Both mirrors reflected Flora without fl flattery or malice, and she felt she could easily learn to rely upon them. Why was it, she wondered, that people seemed to have forgotten how to make mirrors? The old mirrors found in the deserted commercial and family hotels in places like Gravesend or in houses of Victorian relatives at Cheltenham were always superb. One wall was almost filled by a large mahogany wardrobe. A round table to match stood in the middle of the worn red and yellow carpet, which was covered with a design of big flowers. The bed was high and made of mahogany. The quilt was a honeycomb and white. There were two steel engravings upon the walls in frames of yellow, of light yellow wood. One showed the grief of Andromache on beholding the dead body of Hector. The other showed the captivity of Zenobia, queen of Palmyra. Flora pounced on some books which lay on the broad window sill. Macaria, or Altars of Sacrifice, by A.J. Evan Wilson. Home Influence, by Grace Aguilar. Did She Love Him? by James Grant, How She Loved Him? by Florence Marriott. She put these treasures away in a drawer, promising herself a gloat when she should have time. She liked Victorian novels. They were the only kind of novel you could read while you were eating an apple. The curtains were magnificent. They were of solid but regal red brocade, and kept much of the light and air out of the room. Flora looped them back and decided that today they must be washed. Then she went down to breakfast. She followed a broad corridor lit by dirty windows, hung with soiled lace curtains, until it came to a flight of stairs, and at the foot of the stairs, through an open door, she could see into a room with a stone floor. She paused here for a second and noticed a tray on which was the remainder of what had obviously been a large breakfast. Lying on the floor outside, a closed door a little way along the corridor. Good. Someone had breakfasted in their room, and if someone else could, so could she. A smell of burnt porridge floated up from the depths. This did not seem promising. She went down the stairs, her low heels clipping firmly on the stone. At first she thought the kitchen was empty, the fire was almost out, and ash was blowing along the floor, and the table was covered with the intimidating remnants of some kind of meal in which porridge seemed to have played the chief part. The door leading into the yard was open, and the wind blew sluggishly in. Before she did anything else, Flora went across and crisply shut it. Eh! protested a voice from the back of the kitchen near the sink. Never do that, Robert Post, child. I cannot clatter the dishes and wash the dumb beasts and the cow shed both together if ye shut the door. Aye, and there's something else I'm watching for, too. Flora recognized one of the voices that which had disturbed her in the middle of the night. It belonged to old Adam Lambsbreth. He had been listlessly slicing turnips over the sink and interrupted his work to make his protest. I am so sorry, she replied firmly, but I never could eat breakfast with a draught in the room. You can have it open again as soon as I have finished. Is there any breakfast, by the way? Adam shuffled forward into the light. His eyes were like slits of primitive flint in their worn sockets. Flora wondered if he ever washed. This porridge, Rollet Post's child. Is there any